there's a battle that's happening behind the scenes. And sometimes you're like, why is it taking so long? How come God's not, God's not doing it the way that I need him to do it? I need him to do it right now. He knows how to do it. We can trust him that he knows how to do it. And just know he's got an army of angels. Some people say, I have, I have a guard. Do you believe in a guardian angel? Does everybody have a guardian angel? No. I don't think everybody has a guardian angel. I think everybody has a host of angels that God has dispatched to work on your behalf and to protect you. I believe that, I, I believe that, that God can use an angel to deflect a bullet that will just graze your ear instead of your head. I believe God is a God who does the miraculous. Uh, I got an important question for you. Uh, who is excited to get into the Word of God today? Yeah. Woo, yeah. We love God's Word. We believe God's Word is the, what we can stand. I believe it, and we sing it when we were little kids. At least I did. The B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. I stand upon the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. And so I believe that, that we can stand on, on His Word, that His Word uh, is our source of truth. And this morning... Um, as we're in the Word, we're going to be uh, in our series, continue our series, The Spirit, Power, Church, in Action. This is week number 10. Can you believe we're 10 weeks in already? Uh, we got a long ways to go, so buckle up. We're going we're gonna to learn some really good things and, and get some really good things from God. We're in week number 10, uh, on The Spirit, Power, Church, in Action. If you don't know, we've been going through the book of Acts. We've been looking at the early church and learning uh, from, from them some things that they went through, them, some things that they experience, I, I bet you they didn't go through those things just so we can read a nice story in, in a book called the Bible. I believe that they went through those things so we can learn and we can grow and, and we, can, we can move forward in our walks with Christ and we can uh, move forward as the church. Amen? I tell people all the time, I love the book of Acts. One of the reasons I love about the book of Acts, because it has no ending. I believe that we're still living out Acts today, that we are the church. That this is just the story of the beginning of the church, and we're still living it out. We are the church. And so when we read about the book of Acts, we're reading about us. We're reading about the church. Amen? Amen. And last week, if you were here, we covered five verses. We covered Acts chapter 5, verse 12 through 16, and we did, we did five verses, and I kind of explained to you these were transitional verses that were meant to be a vehicle to get us from one story to another. They got us from the story of Ananias and Sapphira, and we got something good last week in those five verses. I believe we got something good last week. Uh, it got us from Ananias and Sapphira to the story that we're going to talk to about you today, of a story about persecution and deliverance. Uh, in the church. And, you know, Luke was a, a doctor, the author of Acts. He was a doctor, Dr. Luke. And he was very extensive in his writings, very detailed in his writings. In fact, the longest, um, the longest uh, chapter that Luke wrote in the Bible is the longest chapter in the New Testament. It's Luke chapter 1, and it's 80 verses long. Um, and, and while Luke isn't the one, or there's not an author in the Bible, that's the one that divided the Bible into verses and chapters. Uh, Bible scholars did that, that later, but they did that for a reason, to kind of keep in context, to kind of kind of uh, keep the, the main themes and the main stories together so we can reference them easy uh, and we can learn from them easy. And so sometimes we're going to get a, a short passage like last week in, our, in our, our series in the book of Acts, which is five verses. And sometimes we're going to get a longer passage like we are today, which is about 25 verses long. And I just want to encourage you this morning, uh, uh, you know me, whether it is five verses or 25 verses, you're going to get a good 40 to 45 minute message out of Pastor Matt. And so that's what we're going to do today. Uh, who's ready? Come on, that's good. If you're not, get ready, because here we go. Acts chapter 5, starting with verse 17. This is what Luke writes. It says, Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. And they arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, and they had been told, or as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and the associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent, uh, to, or the, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported. 
We found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the man you put in jail, or the men you put in jail, are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the, or, and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared uh, the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin and to be questioned by the high priests. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you uh, killed by hanging him on a cross. God exiled him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to us, or to those who obey him. Verse 33 says, when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamiel, a teacher of the law, was honored by all people, stood up to the Sanhedrin and ordered that these men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared, claiming to be somebody, and for about 400, and 400 men rallied to him, and he was killed. All his followers uh, were, uh, or were disappeared, and then they came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led, to a, led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For it is their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. And then ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Verse 41 says, The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name, which is the name of Jesus. Um, Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. It's a long passage, but it's a good passage. You guys still with me today? Come on, let's pray. God, we're so thankful. We are thankful for your word. We pray that your word would go into the depths of our heart and cause us to have faith and cause us to be more like you. Would you transform us today and renew us today? We love you. We thank you. We trust you with all that we are. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. If you're taking notes this morning, the title of our message is I've Been Delivered. Can we all shout that on the count of three together? Come on, here we go. One, two, three. I've been delivered. Some of you didn't shout it. That's okay. You'll shout it at the end. Uh, Don't get me wrong. This is not what your Chinese food says after being dropped off by the Uber Uber Eats driver. I've been delivered. We're not talking about a pizza man or a UPS man or, or anybody that gives you anything except we are talking this morning about our God who can bring deliverance to your situation. If you leave that this morning, can you say amen? There are times in our life where we find ourselves in unbearable situations and circumstances and we need Jesus to intervene on our behalf and rescue us. Maybe this morning you find yourself struggling with addiction. I want to let you know it doesn't matter what the name of the drug is. We know the name of our Lord and the name of our King. We know the name of Jesus and he can deliver you from your addiction if you let him. Maybe this morning you're you're in great danger or of of a physical threat. I believe the Lord is more than able to deliver you from that threat. Maybe you're here and you are spiritually oppressed. You just feel like, come on, there's like this demonic things and spirits that are are weighing you down. We know there is not a demon in hell that can stand against the power of the name of of Jesus, because he, he has all authority over every demon and every devil that would try to oppose him. If you believe that, can you say amen? 
Man, if you're sick and afflicted this morning, I believe that the name of Jesus can deliver you from any infirmity. And here in Acts chapter 5, we see the apostles and the early believers walking out what they prayed for, remember, in chapter 4. We've talked about this few things. What did they pray for at the end of chapter 4? They prayed for boldness. They prayed for signs and wonders and miracles. And here we see these apostles walking these things out. Now remember, they knew that persecution was attached to what they prayed for. They believed it. They said, oh, we know, we know Peter and John's been thrown in jail. We pray for these things, the signs, ones, and miracles, and boldness that, that they had and that they did. Lord, we, we know that there's persecution to follow. But they prayed for it, and they walked it out anyways. Not in private, but in public. In Solomon's colonnade, in, in the eastern part of the temple, they, they still preached Jesus. They still did signs, wonders, and miracles. And we learned about last week, they were doing amazing things for God, even though they knew the other boot was about to drop. And here it is, we see it now. In the second after chapter 5, we see this wave of persecution coming again to the church. We saw the beginnings of it back in early in chapter 4 when Peter and John got thrown into jail. You ever seen, you ever watched the tides before, how there'd be one wave, and it seems to go away, and then another one comes back in. And this is what we're seeing here in the early church, this other wave of persecution now coming in. And the Sadducees. Luke tells us that they were filled with jealousy once again as they were trying to oppose the gospel of truth. And they didn't throw Peter and John in jail this time. They took all 12 apostles. They gathered them up. They put them in, in public jail, the Bible tells us. And we quickly learn that while these, they're the, the, we quickly learn this, that there are those who are hell-bent on stopping the gospel from going forward. There are those who are hell-bent on stopping a move of God. But we know no matter what intention somebody has, what, what forces somebody has, whether it is uh, forces in, in, in the spiritual realm of demonic forces trying to stop the move of God, or whether it is just evil people acting, saying, no, we are stopping this, this thing called Christianity and what they believe. That doesn't matter what the force is. I want to let you know that our God has always been, he is today, he will tomorrow, be always to deliver us from trouble or from harm from the enemy. Can somebody agree with that this morning and he will accomplish it by any means necessary if it is his plan it's his way it's his will it will it will come to pass and he'll accomplish it through any means necessary and it's going to lead us to our first thought this morning it's this the lord can deliver you by miraculous means if that doesn't get you shouting in church, I don't know what will. The Lord can deliver you by, del by miraculous means. We have a God that still does the miraculous today. That what we read was not, this is not a fairy tale. This is not something that happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. We believe that the God that did the miraculous in Mark and Luke and John and Matthew and Acts and, and all throughout the Bible, all throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, we believe that the God that did the miraculous back then is still doing the miraculous today. We serve a God who can deliver us from any situation. And sometimes he'll do miraculous things to make that happen. You know, I learned a long time ago, God is God. He is sovereign. He can do what he wants, when he wants, however he wants. And that frustrates us sometimes because we want him to do it one way and sometimes he'll do it another. You know, but in Exodus, he wanted his people to be delivered from Egyptian slave taskmasters. And what did he do? He sent ten plagues and he split the Red Sea. And allowed them to walk through it. In Judges, he wanted to deliver his people from the oppression of the Philistines. So he raised up people like Samson. Samson, what did he do? He gave Samson superhuman powers to, to be able to combat the enemies. Killed 10,000 Philistines with a jawbone. It's better than any Marvel movie you'll ever see. In the book of Daniel, he shut the mouth of a pride of jungle cats as he delivered Daniel from the lion's den. Come on, we just sang about it a little bit ago. Come on, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were told you've got to bow down to this golden statue or you're, you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace, they refused to bow. 
They were thrown into the fiery furnace. Come on, but, but, but the scripture tells us that there wasn't three in the fire. There was a fourth person in the fire, which was the son of God that delivered them from the flames that day. We serve a God who is more than able to deliver us through miraculous means. And so let's not miss the miraculous this morning in Acts chapter 5. Let's, let's look back at verse 17 again. Can we do that? It says, then the, the high priest and all his associates who were members of the, the party of the, the Sadducees were filled with jealousy and they arrested the apostles and put them into public jail. I love verse 19. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. You know, apostles, they were in jail. But God wasn't done with them. He had a mission for them. There's still people that needed to hear the gospel. There's still much work for them to do. So God sent an angel in the middle of the night to visit him in jail and to release them. I, I don't know about you, but I think this is miraculous. This is, this is amazing. And I think God has a really good sense of humor. He does. I think God, God has a good sense of humor. Why? How, where do you see a sense of humor in here? The Sadducees were one of two major sects in Judaism in, in this day and age that we're reading about in the first century church. The, who were the two major parties in Judaism? It was the Pharisees and the, the Sadducees. And while the Pharisees were, were very letter, the Pharisees were very letter of the law when it came to the law of Moses. And, and, and they also adhered to many teachings or other writings of the Old Testament. And they had to go, uh, they, 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 they believed this, that there was an afterlife, that there were spirits, that there were angels, all these things that you saw in books of prophecy, in the book of Psalms, and, and writings in First and Second Samuels, and First and Second Kings, Chronicles. They believed all this stuff. And they also strongly opposed the Roman government. And the Sadducees were rich aristocrats who generally tried to get along with the Roman government. And they believed that only the first five books of Moses were authoritative and all this other stuff was garbage. They, they believed in Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and that's it. Anything else, we don't believe, we don't want to hear about, we're not going to teach those things. It's not, it's not, it's not who we are and it's not who we should be as, as the nation of Israel. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were like two separate political parties that opposed each other, that believed drastically different uh, in their religion and their political views. And I know we can't relate to that at all today. I don't, I'd, I'd fail to try to find an example of that. But I think it's comical, though. That the group, the Sadducees, the ones who threw the apostles in jail, the ones who were so filled with jealousy that we're going to throw them in jail. All 12 of them, get in there. You are under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Don't speak in the name of Jesus anymore. You're in jail. Ha ha. That the group that didn't believe in spirits and didn't believe in angels threw them in jail. And what did God do to release them from jail? Ah, he sent an angel. Isn't that God? That's just God. God's got a good, he could have done it any other way. God, we see him later, he does earthquakes and he does different things and he gets people out of, out of situations. He's like, this group that doesn't believe in angels, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to send an angel. I'm going to release them from jail. I just think that's funny. But what does this tell me though? In your situation that you are in, not everybody around you needs to believe in the miraculous for God to do the miraculous. That whatever situation you're up against, <laughs> it doesn't matter who's on the other side that believes what they believe or not believe about the power of God. If you believe that God can do the miraculous, I believe he'll do the miraculous in your life. Your doctor doesn't need to believe in healing for the healing hand of God to touch your body. Mom, remember the woman with the issue of blood? She was sick for, for 12 years with this issue of blood. She saw the doctor for 12 years who couldn't do anything for her. But when she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she was made whole. Your landlord doesn't need to believe that God is your provider 
for God to do something miraculous in your finances, to be able to supply you the money that you need to pay your rent and your bills. You remember the story of, of uh, Elisha encountering the widow who says, I'm in deep debt and I have nothing except this little flask of oil. What did he say? He said, get, the, get every jar you can from every neighbor you can. Send out your sons. Get the jars. Now start to pour that oil into the jars. And what happened? The jars were all filled. It was a miraculous thing. And she was able to sell those jars of oil and pay her debt. Remember, God will do it his way, how he wants to do it. He will use the miraculous to deliver you from your situation. Do you believe that? And some of you might be saying, that's good. Yep, Pastor Matt, yep, absolutely. Today's day and age, we believe we can pray that God can hear us, he can do miraculous things. But an angel? Like that's... That is kind of fairy tale That is this kind of Bible time stuff, right? That's not for today. He did that stuff back then, but he doesn't do it today. Can I, can I tell you a quick story? It's a, it's a story that's kind of been in my family for, for decades it, regarding my, my Aunt Miriam, who, who passed away, went to be with Jesus a handful of years ago. But when she was um, uh, living in Indianapolis um, back in the, the early 80s with my cousins, my three cousins, uh, Krista, Brad, and... And Carolyn, not that the name matters of the stories, but she lived in Indianapolis, and my uncle Paul had to go away on business to be trained for, for his job, and so he's going to be gone for an extended period of, of time. And while he was gone, she started getting phone calls on her landline. Ever remember landlines? Yeah, used to, there's things, things that used to get phone calls on. It's miraculous, I know. She started getting phone calls from a guy that she didn't know that said, I know your husband's gone, and I see that you're alone. And she wouldn't say anything. She was terrified. She'd hang up the phone. And back in the day, listen, there's no caller ID. There's no call blocking. There's nothing like that. So the phone rings. She'd pick it up and be this guy. Time after time, her heart was gripped with fear. And the last time that happened, and when she put the phone down, she's shaking, and she heard the voice of God say, next time that happens, next time this man calls, I want you to witness to him. She didn't laugh. <laughs> she was fearful. She said, what? I, no, like I can't even get a word out. Just even tell him to leave me alone. Like I'm, I'm not going to witness to this man, God. I can't, I can't, I'm too afraid. And God told her, he says, I want you to look out your, your window at your backyard. So my aunt went to the, to the window facing out into the backyard and she, she peered out into the backyard and she saw one corner of the backyard and the other corner of the backyard, the far corners of her backyard. She said she saw what appeared to be huge, burly, warrior-like beings. And she said, those are, those are angels. And then God said, I want you to go to your front yard. Look out in your front yard and tell me what you see. And she looked out in the front corners, the two front corners of her front yard. Same thing, each corner. Big, huge, burly, warrior-like angelic beings standing there. Guarding her property. Guarding her house. Guarding her. Guarding her three kids. And then he said, now do you trust me? And right after that, the phone rings. And it's that man again. And so my aunt picks up the phone. She, she, she takes control of the conversation quickly and begins to tell this man about a Jesus that can save him and deliver him from the bondage that he's in. I don't know how long the phone call went, but the man eventually hung up the phone and the calls stopped. Eventually, my uncle came home back from business. Sometime later, there was a phone call again, and this time it wasn't the man. It was the man's wife thanking my aunt. He says, I know that you witnessed to my husband. I know he was into some really weird stuff. I can tell you this, that after you talked to him, he gave his life to the Lord, that he repented, that he got delivered from the spirit of lust, and he's free, and he's living for Jesus. And, and they, they were able to invite them to come. Like, I don't know if anybody invited a, your stalker to the house, but they invited this couple to come, my uncle and aunt. And they, they met each other, and they sat down. They ministered to them. They got them plugged into a church. And those, that couple lived for Jesus in a powerful way after that. That all comes back, though, to God opening the eyes, though, of my aunt. I say, look. 
let me show you something that's happening every single day that your natural eyes cannot see. And just because your natural eyes can't see it does not mean it's not happening. Come on, it reminds me of, of the scripture, Psalm 91, verse 11 through 12. It says, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. I want to let you know this morning, our God is able to deliver us through miraculous means. And often he uses angelic forces that we can't see, that we don't know what's happening. Come on, you could have been here on the way here to church this morning, and you could have gotten a car crash, and there could have been an angel that, that diverted that from happening. You don't know. And we are so stuck on sometimes on always thanking God for the things that we see. God, I thank you for my house. I thank you for my kids. I thank you for finances. I thank you for the blessing. I thank you for healing. We'll, we'll praise him for things that we see. And sometimes it's like, oh, if I don't see God do something today, I can't thank him. Listen, have you ever stopped to consider that maybe sometimes you should start thanking him for the things that are going on all around you that you can't see? Is anybody with me this morning? That there is a God who does things behind the scenes that we don't even know about. I think about the story of Daniel when, when Daniel was praying and, and God sent a, an angelic messenger to come speak to him. But the angelic messenger was delayed. Finally gets there, brings wisdom and understanding to Daniel, but tells him this. I was delayed. There's a battle that's happening. And, and God sent Michael the archangel to come fight against the adversary, the prince of Persia, to get me here. There's a battle that's happening behind the scenes. And sometimes you're like, why is it taking so long? How come God's not doing it the way that I need him to do it? I need him to do it right now. He knows how to do it. We can trust him that he knows how to do it. And just know he's got an army of angels. Some people say, I have, I have a guard. Do you believe in a guardian angel? Does everybody have a guardian angel? No. I don't think everybody has a guardian angel. I think everybody has a host of angels that God has dispatched to work on your behalf and to protect you. I believe, that, I, I believe that, that God can use an angel to deflect a bullet that will just graze your ear instead of your head. I believe God is a God who does the miraculous. And I'm not saying we should worship angels or give angels thanks. They don't need any thanks. They're just servants of the Lord. I think we should give God the glory for what he is doing. He can deliver us through miraculous means. Do you believe that, church? Yes. Come on. And our next thought is this, that God can deliver us through unexpected means. The story wasn't done. The angels, yep, released the apostles from jail, and, and, and what happened? They were, they were obedient to what the angel told him to do. Let's go back to verse 20. It says, go stand in the temple courts, the angel said, and tell the people all about this new life. Oh, I love that right there. He said, go tell them about this new life, what God can do for you in this new life. And, and, and at daybreak, this happened at night. I love the fact they didn't wait a week. Well, let's regroup. Let's, let's get our stuff together, and then let's go do this thing. Let's catch our breath. Let's get our heartbeat to lower a little bit. Let's get our, check their pulse or our blood pressure down. Are we not stressed out? Okay, let's go do this. No, it says immediately at daybreak, the next opportunity they had when the temple is open, they go back. And they've been told, and they began to teach the people. They were not rescued to go into hiding. They were rescued to complete their mission. And that same morning where they, where they went out, daybreak, and they go into the temple, they begin to preach to the people, the, the, the Sanhedrin began to gather. You guys remember who the Sanhedrin are? We learned about this weeks ago. They're the, they're the, the council of 70. There's 70 uh, Jewish people in the, the, the Sanhedrin from both the Pharisees and the Sadducees that come together, and they're the ones who kind of try people. They're the ones that, that kind of keep the law of the land, and so they come together to try the apostles, and so they, they sent for them for, from jail. They said, go, go, get, go get the apostles out of jail, and they are shocked when the person they send comes back and says, uh, the, the doors are locked and the guards are still in place, but there's nobody inside. And then they're even more shocked while they're talking about this. Somebody else comes from another direction, comes in the temple and says, hey, those guys you arrested put in jail? Yeah, they're standing in the temple right now teaching the people. 
what? You imagine they're like, what's going on? So they have to go, embarrassing. They have to go re-arrest the apostles and bring them back. And they said, we know that we can't use force. These people are doing signs, wonders, and miracles. We, we do these things. We try to take them by force. The people are going to stone us. So they took them peacefully, brought them back. And this was the accusation that was made in verse 27. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. It says, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Remember when Peter and John were in jail? That's what they told them. Don't, don't teach in the name of Jesus ever again. So we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. I love this accusation. You have filled Jerusalem with this teaching. Oh man, I wish people would accuse us of that. All oh, that, that, that Missoula, Montana would be filled with the teaching of the saving power and grace of Jesus Christ. That it would be in the streets, that it would be in the supermarkets, that it would be in the mall, it would be in the light, wherever, wherever you are, that there would be a teaching that would fill this city that Jesus still saves and delivers and heals and does miraculous things today. And Peter and the apostles, they fire back. Verse 29, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. This got under the skin of the Sanhedrin so bad because they were the authority. They were the ones who determined whether somebody was breaking the law or not. They were the someone, they thought they determined the will of God. And here the apostle says, we have to obey God rather than you. This enraged the Sanhedrin. They just had Peter and John in jail. And were gracious, they, they thought in their minds, and released them and told them not to speak in the name of Jesus ever again. And now here they have all 12 disciples in jail. And they got out because of an angel. But now we have them back. And here they are mouthing off to us, telling them that they don't have to obey us, that they have to obey God. And they were ready to execute the apostles right there on the spot. They're ready to kill them. That's it. We've made our decisions. Right? You're, you're dead. We're going to kill you. But the apostles who were delivered from jail that night before from an angel were about to be delivered again. But this time not through a miraculous means of an angelic being. But they were delivered through an unexpected source. Verse 34 tells us, but a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who is honored by all people, stood up in the Sanhedrin in order that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. I don't want you to miss what's happening here. Some of you are like, who is this guy? Was he, was a, who's a, was he, one, of the, was he one of the Pharisees that Jesus talked to and, and, and got saved under Jesus' ministry like Nicodemus? No. He wasn't. But everybody knew who he was. This Pharisee was a living legend. He was well known and he was respected. Now this is going to seem weird. By both sides. Can you imagine a man or a person, a politician, a man or a woman, that, that the Republicans and the Democrats both said, we, we will listen to what you say and we will follow your advice. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Here's this. Here's this man who was respected by all. By both religious sides, by both opposing political sides, stood up, was respected by all, and began to speak and gave some good advice. He began to describe two different rebellions that happened in their, their recent history that came to nothing, that fizzled out, that died. And he advised them to treat this, this Jesus movement the same way. Verse 38 says, therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Listen, if it was anyone else in the room that gave that advice, if it was this guy was a Pharisee, but if it was any other Pharisee, anybody else from his political party would have stood up and said these things. The, the Sadducees would have gone, ah, and they would have executed 
the apostles on the spot. It was the other way. The, one of the Sadducees got up and said, we should let these people go and gave the same advice. No, they, they would have, the Pharisees would have been mad and they would have killed the apostles on the spot. But there it's happened to be in the entire Sanhedrin of 70 men, God used the one and only person that could stand up and give this type of advice and have everybody say yes. God used an unexpected source to bring deliverance to that situation. This man was not a Christ follower. In fact, we learn later on in Acts, he's the one who mentored Saul of Tarsus, who wreaked havoc on the church before God rescued Saul and turned him into Paul. And so this man was by no means for the church. He was by no means for Christianity. I think he wanted to snuff it out too. But God softened his heart and used an unexpected man to stand up and to give it godly advice that would allow the apostles to go free. Who knows who God will use in your situation? I'm so glad for the church. I'm so glad for other brothers and sisters that can help us out. I'm so glad for, for, for brothers and sisters in Christ that, that will have our backs. But sometimes we're always looking at the church, the church, the church, the church got to help me, the church got to help me. Who, and then we get frustrated when that doesn't happen. Who knows who God has who's an unbeliever that can meet your needs, that he'll use to do it. Who knows who God has waiting for you at the DMV? Who knows who God has waiting for you at your child's school? Who knows who, who God will use at the electric company? Who knows who God will use in your HOA? Come on. Who knows who God will use as an unexpected source to bring deliverance to your situation? I mean, I'm just reminded in the Bible that, uh, that, that God says, hey, the wealth of the wicked are laid up for the righteous. That God will use anybody. We limit God sometimes by who he can use. Can I let you know he'll, he'll even use politicians in office that we didn't vote for to bring deliverance to us? That God can use anybody. In this world system we live in, are they for Christianity or against Christianity? No, they're against Christianity. It's obvious. But God can use anyone in that system. He can soften someone's heart in an instant to do the work that needs to happen to get you to where you need to be in his will and his plan. Don't approach situations thinking everyone is against you. It doesn't matter if everyone is against you. Listen, God is for you. If God is for you, who can be against you? I want to end with this last thought. Sometimes the Lord does not deliver you the way you think. And I want to invite the, the worship team to, to come as we close. Our, our story ends like, like this. In verse 40, chapter 5. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then he ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name, meaning the name of Jesus. You have to admire the apostles' attitude. What a, what a day, right? They were, they were arrested, put in jail, got released by an angel in the middle of the night, got rearrested. Then we're just facing a tongue lashing. They were, they were going to be executed. And then God delivers them again through an unexpected source. It says that they, they left after they were flogged. They were beaten. It says they left rejoicing that they were worthy the suffering and the persecution that they had for the name of Jesus. That's something we got to grasp. <laughs> when the world's against us, when we face hardships, when, when there is persecution, we should rejoice. They weren't up in arms.
friends. They didn't. They didn't get mad and angry, and we got to teach the Sanhedrin lesson. We'll see this over and over and over and again in the book of Acts. They kept their eyes on Jesus. The St. Peter who sunk in the water because he didn't keep his eyes on Jesus now had his eyes locked on the mission, had his eyes locked on his Savior. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep my eyes on Jesus. And verse 42 says, Day after day in the temple courts, and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. They kept going. They did not stop. Their calling was their priority. And we can, we can stop right here. This is the end of chapter 5. We can put a nice little bow at the end of the story because everything worked out and they all lived happily ever after. No. Because this wasn't the end of the story. Well, they were two for two against the Sanhedrin. Here we go. It's not the end of the story. Verse 42 is very factual. They never stopped. They kept going. No matter what. No matter what the persecution was. They got flogged. Thank you. We're going to go do our thing. It says they never stopped, but it never says that persecution stopped. And it never says that God delivered them every single time, miraculously, or by unexpected sources. If we study first century history in the church, we know the following is the fate of the apostles and other leaders in the church. Can I read this to you real quick? Matthew was beheaded with a sword. Mark, who was a leader in the church, died in Alexandria after being dragged through the streets of the city. Luke, the author of Acts and the Gospel of Luke, was hanged on an olive tree in Greece. Peter was crucified upside down in Rome. James was beheaded in Jerusalem. James, the brother of Jesus, was thrown from a height and beaten with clubs. Philip was hanged. Bartholomew was whipped and beaten until death. Andrew was crucified and preached at the top of his lungs. From the cross he was crucified to his persecutors until he died. Thomas was run through with a spear. Jude was killed with arrows of an executioner. Matthias, who got voted in to be an apostle, was stoned and then beheaded. And so was Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Paul was beheaded in Rome. And the only one who didn't die a natural death, the Apostle John, was boiled in oil three times. That was the end of their story. But really that wasn't the end of their story either. That's not the rosy end of the sermon we wanted. Pastor, right? you're doing really good. You just kind of dropped the ball. That wasn't the end of their story. Through persecution, through imprisonment, and even through death, the disciples would not waver on their faithfulness to the Lord. They would not waver in the way that they lived for Him with all of their heart. They did what they did with joy on the days of triumph, and they did what they did with joy on the days of defeat. They knew this, that temporary deliverance here on earth did not trump the eternal reward that was waiting for them in eternity. That they knew that they would close their eyes in one moment of pain and grief and open their eyes in another moment on the other side of glory, staring into the eyes of their friend and Savior, Jesus. They didn't waver they were faithful. I want to ask you a question. What if God doesn't deliver you from your earthly circumstance the way that you want him to? What are you going to do? Are you going to curse him? Or are you going to praise him? Are you going to walk away from him? Or are you going to serve him? Are you going to leave him? Or are you going to love him? Not a single disciple, I believe, felt abandoned when they died. They knew what was waiting. They were willing to die. They could have stopped at any time. So we're not going to stop. I love the 
the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was what they told the king who's going to throw them into the furnace. They said, we know our God is more than able to deliver us from this furnace. But even if he doesn't, we'll never bow down to that statue. We have Christians today that walk away from God, shaking their fists mad because he doesn't do it the way that they want him to do it. He didn't come through today the way I thought he was going to come through. My rent didn't get paid. My, my, my doctor bill didn't get paid. I still have this sickness. I'm still, uh, this relationship problem still going on. I messed up again and, and I'm still addicted to drugs and they'll somehow they'll blame that on God and get mad at God. Listen, what are you going to do when it doesn't work out the way that you think it's going to work out? Can God deliver you miraculously? Absolutely, 100%. I believe that he will. He does so many times. Well, what about the times that it doesn't happen the way you think? Are you going to stand strong? Are you going to stand on the word? Are you going to stand on the promises of God still and say, it doesn't matter what I see, what the, how the way that I walk for Jesus is not based on what I see, but it's based on what I don't see, that I am a person of faith, and I believe that there is a God who's good, who has a plan and a purpose for my life. Amen? Come on, let's do this. Let's bow our heads. Close your eyes. <coughs> if you're here today and you need God to move in your life. You have a need. Say, I need deliverance. Whether it's something spiritual or something physical, whether it's a financial thing, what, whatever the need is, say, I need God to move. Whether it's in a miraculous way or in an unexpected way or whatever it looks like, I just need Him. If that's you right now, I just want you to lift your hand to heaven. I'd, I'd love to pray with you this morning. Here we go. One, two, three. Yep, 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 yes good come on we're gonna pray in a moment but also want to encourage you stand in the faith stand in the faith be faithful to the Lord in good seasons and bad seasons amen come on let's pray church God I'm so thankful for what you're doing in this place Lord, I, I believe you're the fourth, the fourth man standing in the fire with us. I believe that you're the one who can rescue and deliver us from harm. That can rescue and deliver us from, from spiritual forces. That can rescue and deliver us, God, from, from, from financial dire situations. That can rescue us and deliver us, God, from sickness and disease. Lord, I believe that you are a God who can do miraculous things. You are a God who dispatches his angels. You are a God who, who stretches out your healing hand. You are a God who provides. You are a God who does far above anything we can think or imagine. You are the one that we serve, the one that we trust, the one who can move in our lives. Lord, we pray and we ask you right now to do what you do best, to show up in our hour of need and to heal and to provide and to touch and to make whole and to do the things that you can do in our lives. We believe you for the miraculous. We believe you for miracles. We believe you, Lord, for for your, your voice of wisdom and understanding in our situations. We know and believe with all of our heart that you are at work in us. And I pray right now for strength for every believer in this room that we would stand in the face of adversity, that we would stand in dark places, that we would stand in situations that are dire and trust you. And even when we don't know how it's going to turn out, we know this, that we'll follow you and we'll keep our eyes on you the author and the finisher of our faith. We love you, Lord. We serve you, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said, can we applaud the Lord together? Come on, can we thank him this morning? Come on, he's a good God who can deliver you. He's a good God who has good things for you.